you are physically able to remain standing, please do so and turn in your Bible to Matthew 28. Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. We'll be reading through verses 1 through 15. If you did not bring a Bible with you this morning, there should be one in the pew rack in front of you. You're welcome to use that. If uh, you don't own a Bible, you are welcome to keep that as our gift to you. Uh, We want everyone to have a copy of God's Word that they can read for themselves. And so if you came today and you don't own a Bible, uh, we would love for you to take that and keep that as our gift to you and read that throughout the week. Matthew chapter 28, reading verses 1 through 15. Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen just as he said. Come, see the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee and there they will see me. Now while they were on their way, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers and said, You are to say his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this should come to the governor's ears, we will win him over and keep you out of trouble. And they took the money and did as they had been instructed. And this story was widely spread among the Jews and is to this day. You can be seated. Would you bow with me as we go to the Lord this morning in prayer? Father, we give you great praise this morning because you gave your one and only son to die on a cross for sinners. And you raised him from the dead on the third day. Father, we praise you this morning for the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and the victory that was won over Satan, over sin, over death, how you conquered the world through the resurrection from the dead. Father, we praise you this morning because we know that our victory is in the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you for your great love the love that you demonstrated through this sacrifice and through this incredible miracle, the raising of your son from the dead for our sakes. Father, we thank you that you have given us life. We know that this life is found only in Christ. This life comes because he is alive We have been joined together with him. We have life because he lives. And we thank you, Lord, that this was motivated by your great love. Because of the great love with which you loved us, you raised us up with Christ. And you have seated us with him in heavenly places. Father, we thank you that this love is so permanent, so eternal, that it can never be destroyed. It can never be lost. We thank you that as we read on the screen a few moments ago that there is nothing in all creation that can separate us from your love in Christ. No difficulties, no trials, no persecutions, no height, no depth, no distance. Nothing in the entire created order could ever separate us from your love. And Father, we praise you for that indestructible love that we have through our Lord Jesus Christ and his resurrection. 
Father, we know that not everyone has believed in Christ. Not everyone has this life that comes through faith in him. And so, Lord, we pray this morning for those among us who do not know Christ. Father, we pray that this would be the day that you open their eyes to the truth of the gospel. That this would be the day that they believe in the gospel and that they are saved by the power that comes through the proclamation of the gospel by the Spirit. Father, we pray that on this Resurrection Sunday, you would raise dead sinners to life through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that not only here at Desert Hills, but at churches throughout our city, throughout our state, throughout the nation, even throughout the world, that as they gather to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that many people would be saved. Father, we pray that you would revive your church, that you would pour out your spirit upon the men that you have called and raised up to preach your word, and they would do so with power, with conviction, with compassion, and that the gospel would go forth and triumph over the hearts of sinners. Father, we pray for those that we care about, those that we love, our family, our friends, coworkers, neighbors, fellow students who don't know Christ. Father, we pray for their salvation this morning. Lord, our hearts break for those who do not know you, who do not have the joy of having their sins forgiven and being in fellowship with you. And so we pray for their salvation this morning. Father, we thank you for this time to gather, to reflect upon the message of the gospel. Strengthen our faith in your truth this morning. And glorify your son in our midst today, we pray, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we would like to share a new song with you all this morning. This is a song that was um, written by some of the leaders here at the church, and it's called I Believe the Gospel. And the gospel, simply put, is this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever should believe in him and repent of their sins shall not perish, but will have everlasting life with him in eternity in heaven. And so we, uh, this song celebrates that truth and reminds us all of the common um, hope that we share if we have put our trust in Christ. And it reminds us that the thing that we celebrate today that happened over 2,000 years ago, the event where God raised Jesus from the dead, it was proof that the gospel is true. It was proof that God had accepted Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, that he was pleased by his son's obedience to go to the cross on our behalf. And it proved that Jesus had conquered the sting of death. And that holds true for all of us as we, uh, as we continue in this life, that though, though we face death at the end of our life, though we face uncertainty in the path that we walk, uh, we know that we follow a savior who has risen, who has already won the war, and because of that, nothing can snatch us out of his hand. And so we would ask you guys to just kind of listen along for the first part of the song, but hopefully you're able to join with us and sing as we, as we near the end. Oh, 
take my place The Savior's heel was bruised But the serpent's head was crushed And hell is lost
We thank you for yet another Sunday morning, God, and yet such a, such a special event that we get to remember and commemorate and reflect on this morning and celebrate, Father, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave, proving, Lord, that he had conquered death and that you had accepted his sacrifice paid on the cross on our behalf. And may that truth of the gospel, Father, encourage our hearts this morning as we sing about these truths, as we hear about these truths from your word. Lord, may our hearts be stirred. And no matter what we may go through in this life, Father, we still, we still wrestle and we still struggle with the various trials that we encounter, the various temptations, the discouragements, Father, the stumbling blocks that can happen in this world. Lord, we reminded that we're still in the presence of sin and we are still sinners. Father, and yet we hope for that day when we pass the barrier between life and death, Father, we, we hope, we put our hope in that day in Jesus Christ, that one day we will be able to stand before him blameless with great joy, not because of anything that we have done not because of anything in our own strength, not because of any works that we have somehow accomplished in and of ourselves, but all because Jesus Christ died for us while we were still sinners. You gave your son, Father. And Lord, we worship you this morning. We exalt Christ above all. We ask that his name would be glorified and magnified in this place, that his name truly would be lifted high above all other names, Lord, and that you would glorify your son in and through our worship. Be with us now as we continue to worship and hear from your word. We thank you for the gift, the treasure that is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And we confess with our mouths today with great joy that he is risen 
He is risen indeed. Amen. What a great morning of worship celebrating the victory that we have through our Lord Jesus Christ because of his resurrection. And one of the unique aspects of Christianity is that it is not built upon an idea. It is not built upon a philosophy. It is built upon a historical event. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Uh, Certainly Christianity asserts that there are certain ideas that are true and others that are false. Christianity certainly shapes the way we think. It shapes our worldview and how we understand ourselves and the world around us. Certainly it directs our minds to think a certain way and not to think other ways. But the ideas and the propositions of Christianity are predicated on the historical reality that Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God and the Messiah, died on a cross and on the third day he physically, bodily, was raised from the dead. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 19, the Apostle Paul makes crystal clear that if Christ did not rise from the dead, then Christianity ceases to exist in any meaningful way. There is no Christianity without the resurrection from the dead. Faith is meaningless. Preaching is meaningless. Worship is meaningless. All of it is meaningless without the resurrection of Christ. But Christ has been raised from the dead, and the resurrection of Christ as a historical fact is indisputable. And the evidence for it is insurmountable. Let me give you a few lines of evidence for the resurrection of Jesus from the grave this morning. First, at the most basic level, we have the evidence of the empty tomb. The evidence of the empty tomb. In Luke chapter 24... Luke chapter 24, we have an account of Jesus' resurrection. And in verse 2, it says, When they, the women coming to the tomb, found the stone rolled away from the tomb, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered the tomb, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. The women came to put spices on the dead body of Jesus, assuming that it would soon begin the process of decay. And so they enter into the tomb, and they look for the body, And much to their shock, the tomb was empty. And the body was not there. John 20 tells us that Peter and John, when they entered the tomb, they found the tomb to be empty except for the wrappings with which Jesus' body was wrapped at his burial, neatly folded up in the tomb. In Matthew's abbreviated account, which we read earlier, the angels explain what had happened to the body of Jesus that he was no longer in the tomb. And Mark parallels Matthew's account, noting the explanation the angel gave for the empty tomb. All four Gospels record for us the fact of the empty tomb. And the explanation that the tomb was empty is that Jesus had risen from the dead. There's no other plausible explanation for the empty tomb. The disciples could not have stolen the body. Uh, First of all, they were discouraged, despairing. They had fled from Jesus. One had denied Jesus. One was so afraid the night Jesus was betrayed, he actually ran away naked, left his clothes behind because he was so afraid for his life. This is not a man who is charging a tomb to steal a body. They were dispirited. They were discouraged. All of their hopes had been shattered. Moreover, there was a large stone that had been rolled in front of the tomb, which would have been very difficult to move. And while you were trying to move that stone, the Roman guards would have come and dissuaded you in a not-so-gentle manner from trying to remove the stone. And so it was impossible for the disciples to have stolen the body. And some people say, well, the reason the tomb was empty is because they went to the wrong tomb. They mistook which tomb it was. Okay, so it would have been the easiest thing in the world to disprove Jesus rose from the dead because all you would have to do is say, no, no, here's the tomb and here's the body. You were in the wrong tomb. The reason nobody has ever produced the body, the reason Jesus' body is not 
found is because he is risen from the dead. And the empty tomb is evidence of that. We also have eyewitness testimony. Eyewitness testimony. Not only do we have the evidence of an empty tomb, we have the evidence of eyewitness testimony. The gospel records give eyewitness testimony to the resurrection of Jesus from those who saw him after his resurrection. Throughout the book of Acts, the apostle Paul, who encountered the resurrected Lord over and over again, gives his testimony of Jesus' resurrection. And if you read through the New Testament letters, the apostles assert in those letters that Jesus had risen from the dead and they have seen him. They are witnesses of these events. So from the New Testament, from beginning to end, you have nonstop eyewitness accounts that agree that Jesus rose from the dead. Not only that, but we also have literally hundreds of witnesses to his resurrection cataloged in 1 Corinthians 15. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 says this, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, Peter, then to the twelve, Judas accepted, obviously, and that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. Paul notes here that over 500 people at one time saw the resurrected Lord. And many of them, he says, when he writes 1 Corinthians, somewhere in the 50s, 20 years later after the event had occurred, he says many of them are still alive. Go ask them. You can get the testimony for yourself. You can hear the eyewitness testimony. And so if anyone doubted the resurrection from Paul, there were hundreds, literally hundreds of witnesses that would have testified to the exact same thing. Eyewitness testimony from multiple witnesses that all agree makes for some of the strongest evidence to an event's historicity imaginable. In fact, when we look at ancient history, it is the strongest evidence that an event occurred, eyewitness testimony. And so Paul is asserting in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8, in the most emphatic terms possible, that Christ has risen from the dead bodily. His body came out of the grave. And anyone who wanted to know the truthfulness of that claim could ask Paul or hundreds of people who had seen him alive from the dead. A third line of evidence we have for the resurrection of Christ is the fulfillment of prophecy. The fulfillment of prophecy. In 1 Corinthians 15 verse 4, it says that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. In John chapter 20 Verse 9, John makes this point about himself and Peter as well when he says in John 20, verse 9, For as yet they, John and Peter, did not understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. And so the resurrection of Jesus was not some new idea that God had after he was crucified. Well, what, now what are we going to do? Uh, let's raise him from the dead. No, this was something that was prophesied in the Old Testament. This was always the purpose and plan of God for the Messiah. And so we can see in the Old Testament how God was fulfilling his promise. Let me just give you a few examples because sometimes people say, well, where does the Old Testament say that? Let me give you a few examples. Psalm 16. Psalm 16, verse 10. David is writing, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Now you notice in that verse, David does not say, nor will you allow me to undergo decay. He can't say that because David was going to die and he was going to decay and his body would rot in the tomb and we know that he died and we know that he, uh, his body decomposed. So he says, you will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay. So the Holy One will die, but he won't decompose. He won't decay, and that's only possible if he's raised from the dead relatively soon after dying. David doesn't tell us how many days it would be for the resurrection, but in the ancient world, about the fourth day, as we see in the account of Lazarus, is when the odor started. The decay started around day four. So from Psalm 1610, we can infer that the Messiah would be raised from the dead within three days of dying. Another example, Hosea chapter 6. 
Hosea chapter 6, verse 2. Hosea chapter 6, verse 2. If you don't know where Hosea is, that's okay. You can just listen along. It's towards the back of the Old Testament. The prophet says this, He will revive us after two days. He will raise us up on the third day that we may live before him. Now you say, well, that doesn't say he will raise up the Messiah. It says he will raise us up on the third day. We will live before him. It does say that. Because the prophet is talking about more than one thing. The prophet is talking about our ability to have life in the presence of God. Why is it that we are raised to newness of life and live in the presence of God? There's only one reason why, and it's because Jesus was raised from the dead. That is why we have life. That is how we have life. And so when the prophet says he will revive us after two days, he will raise us up on the third day, he's not speaking of just us. He's speaking of the Messiah and all of his people in corporate solidarity with him. Us being the Messiah and his covenant people will be raised up on the third day. In fact, Romans 6 is, is basically a commentary on Hosea 6 too. We died with him. We were buried with him. We've been raised to newness of life with Christ. When did that happen? When were we raised? When he was raised. We've been raised to life on the third day because that's when he was raised and his life is the source of our life. And so Hosea makes it clear that the Messiah would rise from the dead on the third day and all of the Messiah's people then would receive life because of his resurrection. Now the other passage isn't so much a passage as it is an entire narrative in the Old Testament and it's the book of Jonah. Jesus references this in Matthew chapter 12 verse 40. Matthew chapter 12 verse 40, Jesus said, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jonah is a prophecy of the resurrection of Christ. That's what Jesus is saying. Have you ever thought to yourself, you know, why is Jonah in the prophets? We call them the minor prophets, those 12 little books, mostly little, some of them are a little bit longer, but mostly little prophetic books at the end of the Old Testament? Or why in the prophets at all? You've got Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, you've got the 12. And if you read through those 15 books, they don't read like Jonah. In fact, a lot of times in our Bible reading plan, we get to Jonah, we feel like we're coming up for air after reading on the prophets leading up to that. And no, judgment, 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 judgment. I mean, God is angry with Israel, right? Oracle of judgment after judgment. Isaiah, and Jeremiah, Ezekiel. And, and there's so judgment on Israel, judgment on the nations. There's some promises of salvation weaved in through that judgment. And then we come to Jonah and it's like, oh, here's a nice story about a, a man and a fish and a boat. This is much calmer than uh, what I've been reading. You know, it's a narrative, so it's a story I can follow. On. But what is it doing there? Why isn't it back with 2 Kings somewhere or something like that where the other narratives are? Because they understood, the prophets understood that Jonah wasn't just a historical narrative. It is a historical narrative. It really happened. Jesus said just as Jonah was in the belly of the sea monster. So it's not just a make-believe story. Jonah actually was in the belly of the sea monster, but he was there as a prophetic event. These are prophetic events that tell us about the resurrection of Christ, and catch this now, the salvation that would come to Gentiles as a consequence. That's what the book is about. It's about Jesus being raised from the dead and salvation going to all the earth, beginning from Jerusalem. This is a prophetic work that Jesus fulfilled through his resurrection. And so when we think about these three lines of evidence, we have the empty tomb, we have eyewitness testimony, we have the fulfillment of prophecy. We only have one reasonable conclusion. Jesus was bodily raised from the dead on the third day. The empty tomb testifies to it, the witnesses testify to it, the scripture testifies to it. But despite all of this evidence, this clear evidence... Not everyone responds to the resurrection in the same way. When people are confronted with this reality, they have different ways that they respond to it. And for the rest of our time this morning, I want to show you five different ways that people respond to Jesus' resurrection in the New Testament. 
And these will parallel the way people respond to the resurrection today. The first response to Jesus' resurrection in the New Testament and even today is deception. Deception. And we read about this in Matthew chapter 28, verses 11 through 15. Now, while they, the women, were on their way, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priest all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers and said, You are to say, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this should come to the governor's ears, we will win him over and keep you out of trouble. And they took the money and did as they had been instructed, and this story was widely spread among the Jews and is to this day. Here's the first response, deception. We know about the resurrection. We know it's true. We know the evidence. We know what happened. But we're not going to submit to Christ as Lord. We will lie about what we know is true. We will deceive others about the resurrection. We know the guards knew the resurrection was true. They saw it. In Matthew 28, verses 2 through 4, it it talks about how the guards saw the angel, the stone getting rolled away, the earthquake that occurred. And they were terrified. I mean, here's these big, strong Roman guards guarding the tomb. An angel shows up, they're out. Like dead men, passed out cold because of fear. And so they know exactly what happened. They know that Jesus was raised from the dead. They know an angel appeared. And so they go in verse 11, probably to try to save their own necks from being executed for losing a dead body and messing up the easiest assignment that had ever been given to a Roman soldier, right? Just make sure this dead body doesn't go anywhere. That's all you got to do. They don't do it. Okay, we got to go. Some of you stay here. Some of us are going to go talk to the chief priest and see if we can get, talk our way out of this. And so they go, and the chief priests essentially say, here's some money, go lie. You know what happened. We know what happened. We all know that Jesus rose from the dead, but we're not going to admit that. We're not going to submit to that. We're going to tell other people it didn't happen. And we're going to concoct a story that will spread. And it's fascinating. Matthew says even to this day that story was still spread among the Jews. That was 20 years later when Matthew wrote his gospel that Jesus' disciples stole the body. People believe the lie. And this is what people do with Jesus' resurrection today. They know he rose from the dead. The the evidence is is insurmountable. The evidence is overwhelming that Jesus rose from the dead. But rather than admit that and submit to Jesus, they lie. And they concoct some other story about why the resurrection didn't happen and and some other explanation other than a bodily resurrection. One of the most famous New Testament scholars of the early 20th century was the German theologian Rudolf Boltmann. Boltmann is uh, so renowned as a scholar that if you read almost any book on New Testament studies, Boltmann is going to be in the bibliography. And Boltmann famously declared that the resurrection of Christ was not a historical event, but merely an existential religious experience. He knew better. In 1984, a pastor named David Jenkins described the idea of Christ's resurrection as, and I quote, a conjuring trick with bones, end quote. This is a pastor. He knows better. He's done his homework. He's done his research. He knows the evidence, but he lies. Roman Catholic professor John Dominic Crossan rejects the historicity of Jesus' resurrection. Presbyterian professor Gerd Ludeman, who died three years ago, rejected the bodily resurrection of Christ as well. These are all religious scholars, and you can see they come from all over the spectrum. It's not just that the Baptists or the Presbyterians or the Lutherans or the Methodists or the Roman Catholics lie about the resurrection of Jesus. You have scholars and pastors from every background lying about this. They know what is true, and they reject it for a lie. One of the most notorious opponents of Christianity who has set himself up as a scholar of the New Testament and early Christian history and literature is named Bart Ehrman. Bart Ehrman rejects that Jesus rose bodily from the dead. He suggests instead that Paul and maybe Peter and even Mary Magdalene were suffering from what psychologists today would call grief hallucinations. This is a supposed expert. Bart Ehrman is not stupid. 
He's a heretic, but he's not stupid. He knows the facts and the evidence for Jesus' resurrection. And just like the soldiers in the first century, he gets paid to lie about it. They all do the same thing. They're lying about what they know is true. And the tragic thing is that today many people believe the lies of these so-called scholars and theologians. In fact, it's not uncommon to evangelize and hear people say something like this. Well, I, don't, I can't know that Jesus rose from the dead because I was watching the History Channel. Maybe you've encountered this. And Professor so-and-so from such-and-such such university or theological seminary says that the resurrection might have just been a spiritual experience. And there's a lot of debate about that. And they believe the lies. People lie about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They know it's true. They've studied it. They know the evidence. It's all there for them to see. But rather than submit to Jesus, they lie about him. Another response we see today in addition to deception, and that we see it in the Bible as well, is anger. Some people aren't worried about lying about the resurrection. They just get angry about it. Acts chapter 4. Look at Acts chapter 4. This is a very common response throughout the book of Acts. It's Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. As they, the apostles, were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them, being greatly disturbed. Notice that. Greatly disturbed. They're upset. They're angry. And what are they angry about? Because... They, the apostles, were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus what? The resurrection. The resurrection from the dead. Oh, they were upset about this. And so they laid hands on them and they put them in jail until the next day for it was already evening. Here's anger. They're preaching Jesus was raised from the dead. They had just healed somebody. You couldn't do much to deny it. Couldn't really lie about it. Here's the beggar that had been healed talking about Jesus and how he had been healed in Jesus' name. And so when you can't lie about it successfully, what do you do? You get angry and you assault the messenger. You attack the one who is proclaiming the, the resurrection. We see it again in Acts 5, verse 30. Acts 5, verse 30, Peter says this, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had put to death by hanging him on a cross. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. So Peter preaches the resurrection, right? Jesus was raised from the dead. But when they heard this, verse 33, they were cut to the quick and intended to kill them. There's no d desire for debate. There's no desire even to deceive about this at this point. This is just we are angry. We are hostile to the truth of the resurrection. We will now kill you for preaching it. This happens again in Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 3. It says, now when they, this is Paul now, when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. And so here Paul comes into Thessalonica, and as he does every Saturday, he preaches the, the gospel, he opens the Bible, and he shows people that the Old Testament teaches Jesus had to rise from the dead. He preaches the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the facts of the gospel. He came, he suffered, he died, he rose. Everyone who believes will have eternal life. And in verse 5, notice the response. But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking along, along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar and attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. This is anger, hostility. Paul goes and preaches the resurrection of Jesus. They get so angry, they form a mob, an unruly, angry mob. We saw this and we see this in our country from time to time when people are upset about some perceived injustice or unfair treatment. What do they do? They get angry and so they form a mob and they riot and they burn and they loot and they vandalize things. And that's essentially what's going on here. Except what's being proclaimed is the resurrection of Christ. And they get so mad that they get their mob together and they get their pitchforks and their torches and they march to this guy Jason's house and they start vandalizing his property to try to get him to come out. 
They get mad about the gospel, mad about the resurrection of Christ. And, and even today, this is a common response to the resurrection of Christ by those who refuse to believe in him. They can't dispute the, the evidence. The evidence is clear. Jesus rose from the dead. But they don't want to submit to Jesus. And so they get angry. They become hostile. And what do they do? They attack the messenger who's proclaiming the message. This is exactly what happened in Acts chapter 7 to Stephen, wasn't it? Stephen says Jesus has been raised and is standing at the right hand of God the Father, reigning. And, and the listeners got so angry that like little children who don't want to hear their parents' instruction, they put their fingers in their ears, scream out loud, and stoned him to death in a rage. They couldn't cope with his arguments from Scripture, from his arguments, with his arguments from history. And so rather than repent, they became outraged and they killed him. This happens today with persecution of Christians all over the world. Why do people persecute and kill Christians? It's not because they think what we believe is false. It's because they know what we believe is true and they hate it. And so they don't want to proclaiming it and preaching it. They can't argue with the facts of Christianity. They can't win the argument over truth. And so rather than bow their knee to Christ as Lord, they kill his messengers. Even in our own nation, we don't have violence against Christians that is sanctioned by the state, but we encounter people on a regular basis who are angry with the word of God, aren't they? They're angry about what God has said in his word. They don't submit they don't lie about it. They recognize that's what the Bible says, but they are hostile toward it. They're hostile towards Christians and Christianity. And so a second response people have in addition to deception is anger. Third, some people respond to Jesus' resurrection with mockery. Mockery. Mockery is, is similar to anger, but it expresses itself in a slightly different way. Anger results in outright hostility and even violence, but mockery is not violent but dismissive. It's derogatory. It's a different kind of contempt expressed a different way where instead of attacking the messenger physically, you attack them by belittling them and calling their message intellectually inferior, childish, or stupid. In Acts 17.32, we see just this kind of response from those in Athens who heard the truth of the resurrection. It says, now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer. Sneer. Paul is there. He's preaching. He's giving evidence after evidence for who God is, what God has done, how he sent his son to die for sinners, how God is going to judge the world in righteousness. And so all people everywhere are commanded to repent. And the climax of his message comes in verse 31, where he says to the people that God proved this is true by raising his son Jesus from the dead. That's the proof. That clinches it, that you should repent and believe in the true and living God and get rid of all of your idols and all of your altars. And when Paul gets to this point, the indisputable proof that God is who he says he is and he does what he has promised to do and we must repent and believe in him because of Jesus' resurrection, he comes to this point and as soon as he talks about resurrection, some began to sneer. They mocked. They made fun of Paul. They scoffed maliciously at him. They belittle him and his message. These high-minded Greeks who thought of themselves as so intellectually sophisticated made fun of Paul when he spoke of the resurrection from the dead. They indicate, Paul, you're out of touch. Nobody believes that anymore, Paul. Don't you know it's the first century? I mean, we gave up on those beliefs a long time ago. I look at all of our advances in education, all of our advances in medicine, all the new technology we have, all the new ideas. We know so much more now, Paul, than people did way back when, when people actually believed in all those myths, like resurrection. Does that sound familiar? People do the same thing today, don't they? We don't believe in Jesus' resurrection. Are you kidding me? Nobody believes that kind of stuff anymore. That's just religious mythology. All of those things from the ancient world, they all had their different creation myths and their different redeemer myths. And, and the Bible is just one of many different kinds of myths that existed. And, and no serious person actually believes in that. 
The world constantly seeks to belittle the truth of God's word, to mock at it, to deride it as something not even fit for children. In fact, believing in the resurrection of Christ in today's culture for many people isn't much different than saying you believe in Santa Claus or in the Easter Bunny. It's absurd. It's a fairy tale, people think. So many people sneer and mock at the truth of the resurrection. And I think that's true even for many people who attend church on a regular basis. In fact, polls would bear that out, that many people who go to church on a regular basis don't actually believe Jesus physically, bodily rose from the dead. They like a lot of what the church has to offer, you, friends, community, significance. Church is about something greater than yourself. Uh, there's a sense of transcendence you get in worship. There's hope there. There's love there. But when you get down to the core doctrines of Christianity and you really press and you say, do you believe that a man who is also the son of God, God in human flesh, died on a cross and his body physically came out of the grave? He rose from the dead. Do you actually believe that? There's a lot of people that attend church every week that would say, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't need to get into all of that. I, I kind of like the spiritual side of Christianity. That, that isn't really that important to me, or I don't really believe that. that that's a little bit different than what I would want to get into, or I'm not really concerned about that. Barna and Gallup polls bear this out, that professing Christians would say they don't believe, or they're not sure if Jesus rose bodily from the dead. This is the culture we live at, and people mock this, they deride it, they think it's silly and childish, and so they sneer and they mock at the truth of the resurrection. A fourth response that people have is doubt. Doubt. The story of doubt is a familiar one because the apostle who doubted has been given a nickname. I don't know if he'll bear this name through all of eternity. I don't know if they call him this up in heaven still or... If he shed that by now, but down here on earth, we refer to him as Doubting Thomas. And we read about him in John 20. John chapter 20, verse 24, it says that Thomas was not with the disciples the first time that Jesus appeared to them. And so the disciples in verse 25 were saying to him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not Belief. He doubted. Unless he gets to see for himself that Jesus is alive from the dead, he's not believing it. Now, why didn't Thomas believe? That's a, uh, that's a very interesting question. Because he knew the disciples. He, he knew their credibility. He had spent every waking moment with these guys over the last three plus years. He knew that they were truthful, that they had integrity. He knew that they loved Jesus the way that he loved Jesus. And he had heard the teaching of Jesus. He had heard Jesus say that he would rise from the dead. And resurrection for Thomas wasn't a strange idea. We read about Jesus raising a young boy from the dead. His mother was a widow. It was her only son. She was from a little village called Nain. And Jesus sees the funeral procession and raises the boy from the dead. We read about Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And it was Thomas who said, let's go die with him. When he went to raise Lazarus from the dead, Thomas knew about resurrection. He'd seen resurrection. The disciples tell him Jesus had been raised from the dead. So why didn't he believe it? Well, some people say, well, because he was too broken, you see. He couldn't handle any more disappointment. His hopes had already been shattered at the cross. I mean, for him to believe that would have got his hope going again. And then if he would have found out it wasn't true, it would have been all over devastation. He just didn't want to risk that kind of pain. Maybe Thomas was just stubborn. You know people who uh, have to learn every hard lesson for themselves. They can't ever learn from other people's mistakes. They're stubborn. They're hard-headed. Maybe, maybe you are one of those people. You know, I, I'm, I don't care how many people get burned touching that stove. Until I touch it, I'm not going to be convinced I'm not going to get burned. You know, there are people that are like that. Maybe Thomas was just stubborn. I got to see it for myself. Ultimately, we don't know why Thomas didn't believe the apostolic testimony. It doesn't really matter much for us why he didn't believe. But if you don't believe in Jesus' resurrection, I think what matters most today is not why Thomas doubted, but why you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Some people say, well, I don't believe that because I've sinned too much. 
I'm, I'm too far gone. The things I've done, the things I've said, the people I've hurt, the amount of sin in my life, God could never forgive me, could never accept me. I'm glad that other people find peace through the resurrection of Jesus, but if you knew me, you would know that this message does not relate to me. Others recognize they don't believe because they love their sin too much. I've had people tell me that they recognize those facts are true, but they really enjoy sleeping with their boyfriend or their girlfriend too much. They don't really want to give that up to follow Jesus. And so they will not confess that he is Lord. They will not submit to the truth that he died and rose again for sinners because they love their sin. They want to look at their pornography. They want to do whatever it is that they're doing that they know that God disapproves of. So they doubt, they disbelieve. Others say they don't believe because of how they've been hurt by professing Christians. Maybe you've heard that. I, you know, I, I, I've been, you don't know how Christians have treated me. Been cruel to me. They say they believe in Jesus' resurrection. Well, how come they're so unkind and so unloving? I, be, I don't believe that because I've seen the people who say they do. And they don't really seem to have resurrection life. There's a lot of reasons why people would say they don't believe the reality of the resurrection to resolve Thomas's doubts, Jesus appears to Thomas in verses 26 through 29. It says, after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, reach here with your finger and see my hands. And reach here your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. The fact of the resurrection was true whether Thomas had believed it or not, wasn't it? And Thomas could have had the joy of believing in the resurrected Christ a week earlier if he would have believed the apostolic testimony. Jesus indicates the norm moving forward will be people not to see him, but to believe in him based on the testimony of those who saw him alive from the dead. And so the question comes to you if you do not believe in the resurrection of Christ in this way, what will you trust? Will you trust your experiences? Well, people have hurt me, so Jesus must not be alive from the dead. Will that be your authority the way you have been treated by others? Will you trust your sinful desires that they are telling you the truth? Will you trust your emotions? I just feel too guilty for God to forgive. Or will you trust what God has said in his word through the apostolic testimony? This is the challenge that Jesus is laying down to Thomas and to all who would come after you, you don't need to see to understand that it's true. You believe the testimony of God in his word. And, and so many people doubt based on an experience or a desire or an emotion or a feeling they have. But what shapes reality, objective reality, is not our interpretation of our experiences or our sinful desires or our emotional states. What determines and defines reality is what God has said in his word. And so for those who do not believe in the resurrection of Christ, the challenge is simply this. What authority are you going to trust? Your experience? Your feelings? Or the word of God? The testimony of those who saw Jesus alive from the dead. When we hear the truth of the resurrection of Christ in the word of God, the response that God calls us to have is the final and fifth response this morning, and that is the response of faith. Faith And look over at Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, verse 8. We come to the account of the women who went to the tomb. The angel appears and tells them that Jesus has risen from the dead. And in verse 8 it says, And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. And what this verse is saying, what Matthew is saying, is these women believed they believed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's important to note, please notice in your Bible, 
that they had not seen Jesus yet. Unlike Thomas, they believed without seeing. They believed based on testimony. And they didn't demand to see Jesus for themselves in order to believe. Now you say, but Matthew doesn't say they believed. He doesn't have to. Because he describes what faith does in the verse. He says, and they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy. Do you see that? Their faith is evident in fear and great joy. There is no great joy apart from faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If they hadn't believed the message, Matthew wouldn't have said they had great joy because they wouldn't have had joy yet. We know they believed. And so they were filled with fear and great joy. That is the strangest statement in the Bible maybe. Fear and, we would probably expect, trembling. No, fear and great joy. You ever been so scared you're happy? <laughs> you ever been so happy you're scared? Faith produces fearful joy. Fearful joy. A serious joy, a reverent joy, a joy that is accompanied by the fear of God. The resurrection of Christ should flood our hearts with joy and happiness, but not the fleeting or flippant happiness of the world, but a happiness that is intermingled with a reverence for God and his power and his love and his justice and his mercy and his wrath. As Christians who believe Jesus rose from the dead, we are serious about joy and we are joyfully serious. Because we worship a holy God who is both merciful and mighty. And so we fear him. And we have great joy in our fear of him. Notice their faith is evident not only in their fearful joy, but in their proclamation of the good news of Jesus' resurrection. It says they ran to report it to his disciples. Listen, faith is not content to be silent. Faith cannot help but express this joy by telling people what Jesus has done in rising from the dead. Faith must speak. This is the overflow of faith, the outflow of faith. We want to tell others that Jesus is alive and call them to salvation in his name. As these women are on the way to deliver the joyful and fearful news of Jesus' resurrection, verse 9 happens. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them. That word there, behold, really is, it means look. And it's really sort of trying to get you to have a mental picture. Look, there's Jesus. Meeting them. Greeting them. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. This is the goal of faith, beloved. Worship. This is where faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ leads. Fear, joy, proclamation. What is the point of it all? Worship. Worship of Christ. Jesus rose from the dead so that we might become his worshipers. Worshipers of the true and living God who have forsaken all idols and false gods and worship him alone. It's so vital that we grasp this response of faith as worship and what it entails because many people today would claim to believe in Jesus and his resurrection, but they are not true worshipers of Christ. Worship is not a priority in their lives. They come to church when it's convenient. Or maybe they come like today, just on special occasions or holidays. They rarely read their Bible. They never pray. Their lives are marked by an absence of worship. They live for themselves. Their bodies are not being presented as a living sacrifice to the Lord, as a spiritual act of worship. And they claim and perhaps even have convinced themselves that they are followers of Christ, that they believe in Jesus Christ. But note this, true followers of Christ, those who have savingly believed in his resurrection from the dead, become his worshipers. There's no saving faith without worship. Faith must worship. If you say you believe in Jesus, 
But your life is not defined as one continuous, unbroken act of worship of Jesus Christ. Whatever faith you think you have is not saving faith. Because it's not leading you to worship. Faith doesn't worship to earn heaven. Faith worships because it understands that worshiping Christ is heaven. It is our highest joy. It is our greatest privilege. We worship not to gain heaven, but because we have gained heaven. And all that happens in heaven for all eternity is worship. This is where faith leads. How do you respond to the fact of Jesus' resurrection? You know, the reality is that everybody in this room is in one of these five categories. Some people have deceived themselves about the resurrection. Maybe they even deceive others about the resurrection. Some people may be angry as this message comes to a close because they don't like the truth of Jesus' resurrection and what it demands of them. Some people think that everything I've been saying is ridiculous, foolish, nonsense, good for me, but ultimately I might as well also believe in Santa Claus. Some people here today maybe think, you know, I really want to believe, but there's something holding me back. And you've never yielded your heart to Christ in faith. Well, these responses are all different in a way. They all have one thing in common. They lead to eternal destruction and condemnation under the wrath of God in the lake of fire. Those who believe lies, those who are angry with God, those who mock his word, those who doubt his promise are outside the kingdom of God. The only saving response to the resurrection of Christ is faith to look at what the Bible says, to look at the overwhelming evidence for Jesus' resurrection and to recognize that his resurrection proves that he is Lord and Christ, as we sang in that new song, the only Lord and Christ. And you must submit your heart to what the word of God says. You must recognize your sins are leading you to destruction and turning away from your sins and your unbelief, you must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, God has promised forgiveness and righteousness and eternal life to everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord in faith. There's no asterisk there. There's no except for people who have done this, that, or the other. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you do not know Christ today, if you have not responded to him in faith, I plead with you on Christ's behalf, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and in his resurrection from the dead and you will be saved. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your salvation that you have given to us in Christ. Lord, we thank you for the faith that you have given to us as a gift, not of ourselves, not of our own doing, but it is your gift by your grace. Thank you that you have opened our eyes, opened our ears, given us hearts to believe and understand. Father, we know that is a gift of salvation from you, and we praise you for it. We give you all the glory for it, but Lord, we also pray that you would continue to do that for those who don't know Christ. Do it again in somebody else, God. And again and again and again. Father, we thank you that you are a God who does not tire of saving, but you delight in loving kindness. You delight in salvation. You take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And so, Lord, we pray that you would save those who do not know Christ that are listening today, whether they're listening online, whether they're here this morning. Father, we pray for their salvation. And, Father, I pray for those of us who know Christ. Father, I pray that you would increase our fear, and our joy. Our desire to tell and our worship. 
Father, I pray that the resurrection would overwhelm and thrill our hearts so that we might reverence you as you deserve, that we might have the fullness of joy that you promised, that we might joyfully praise you so others hear about the great things you have done and are called to faith, and Father, ultimately so that those worshipers that you are seeking would come and worship before you. Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Now, would you stand with me this morning as we close our time together? And we'll bring it full circle and close where we started. He is risen. risen Have a blessed day celebrating his resurrection today. You are dismissed.